Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters, Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Flight follow now two hours and ten minutes old, two hours and ten minutes into what may be a 147-hour, six-day flight to the moon and back. That decision will be made shortly. And tentatively, the Apollo 8 has a go decision for injecting itself into a translunar trajectory to go out to the moon, 230,000 miles away. Right now, the spacecraft is northeast of Salisbury, Rhodesia, 119 miles high, making it 17,500 miles an hour of its uh, Earth uh, orbiting speed. And the decision to come uh, to go to the moon must come by 10.16 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. That's uh, some 14 minutes from now. And then, if the decision is go, and it appears that it will be, because everything has been perfect so far this morning, ignition of the third stage engine will come at 10.41 Eastern Time, east of Hawaii, while it is still dark out there, and very possibly the people of Hawaii will see it through the clouds that we understand hang over Hawaii this morning as that uh, great 230,000-pound uh, uh, thrust engine fires up. For five minutes and 41 seconds, it fires uh, to put the Apollo 8 on the way to the moon. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. If it should turn out that they cannot put the Apollo 8 into a lunar orbit, or choose for any reason not to, if any of the spacecraft systems begin to act up in this next uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, from now, uh, or the third stage of the Saturn booster does not function properly uh, to put the spacecraft into the uh, lunar orbit, uh, it can still uh, go out to the moon and come back perhaps, not if the S-4B third stage doesn't fire, but if the other decisions could be made, uh, they might do that. They could also go out for a high Earth orbit or just stay in a low Earth orbit for up to 10 days to test out uh, the other Apollo systems. It doesn't appear that any of that is going to be necessary. Everything is going smoothly for the translunar trajectory. Let's go out to Downey, California now, and Bill Stout. And Bill, uh, can you and our uh, test app Apollo 8 uh, mock-up there at North American Rockwell. Give us an idea of what the astronauts are doing as they come up on this important uh, pass across uh, Africa and the Indian Ocean before the decision to go into translunar trajectory. Walter, Leo is uh, chief Apollo research pilot here at North American, and I imagine that he, uh, like you and me and everyone else, is sweating out these next few minutes to find out if the decision is going to be to go for the moon. What, uh, while they're waiting, I imagine they're pretty busy, even while they're waiting, but uh, while they're sweating out this decision, Leo, what are they doing? What chores are there for Borman and Lovell and Andrews at this point? Well, right now, they're probably going over their translunar injection uh, preparation list. Each uh, pilot will again have a checklist that he'll be setting up his panel. Now, Frank Borman has a lot of switches to set up on his panel, and in addition, he'll be setting up the entry monitor system so he can monitor the increase in velocity that we're going to get from the S4B or the Delta V. Now, the way he'll do this, switch here, and then by pressing this slew button, he will be able to slew in the Delta V that the S4B is going to attain during this maneuver. Now, I believe it's somewhere in the vicinity of 10,000 feet. I don't have the exact figures. However, he will slew this until he's reading 10,000 feet or the proper value in this window. Del which delta V is simply velocity. Isn't that's it? the change in velocity. Change in, in other velocity. words, the velocity we're orbiting at at the present oh. time, when we fire the S4B, we're going to gain a delta V or an increase in velocity mm. of approximately 10,000 uh, feet per second. You, you have to pick up 10,000 feet per second to escape from the Earth and make that trip around the moon. That's right. That'll bring us to approximately 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, as soon as he gets the delta V cranked into this window, he will then take this switch to auto and move this switch to delta V. Now he's now armed the circuit so that when the engine does fire, the acceleration that is felt, there's an accelerometer in this system that will sense that acceleration and integrate the acceleration and start counting this velocity down. In other words, uh, as the engine fires, this 
counter will be running in a decreasing direction. And it's an automatic shutoff when the proper velocity is reached. Is that well, correct? if everything works properly, when the delta V reaches zero, the S4B will, at that time, have a shutoff signal. Now, if something should happen that the S4B does not automatically shut off when the delta V uh, reaches zero, uh, Frank has two options in the cockpit he can exercise. One is he can take this switch right here and throw that switch up, which will shut off S4B ignition. Or, in his left hand, he has a translational hand controller. He can take the translational hand controller and turn it counterclockwise and then back to neutral, and that will also send a booster cutoff signal. So he has two backups to terminate uh, S4B ignition when he reaches the proper velocity, but this gives him an opportunity in the cockpit to monitor the S4B performance during the burn. And if all goes well, it turns itself off automatically. But they don't separate from the uh, Saturn 4B at this point, even though they may be through using it to get that extra velocity toward the moon, they stay with that part of the spacecraft for a while longer, don't they? That's right. They'll stay with the uh, S4B approximately uh, 13 or 14 minutes after uh, cutoff. And during this time, the S4B attitude system will be putting the vehicle to the proper attitude for separation, which is a maneuver that will follow the translunar injection. Uh, there's one other point, Bill. Uh, while the S4B is is burning, Frank will be monitoring this delta V counter, but he'll also be watching his flight direction attitude indicator, which is this instrument right here. Now this tells him the vehicle attitude, and these three gauges around here tell him the, the vehicle rates for roll, pitch, or yaw. Now, if everything goes well, the rates should stay rather low. If they exceed plus or minus 10 degrees a second, uh, it would probably indicate a failure to him, in which case he would uh, execute an abort. But so far, at any rate, and uh, it, it looks as though it's going to continue that way, Walter, so far everything seems to be going smoothly. Leo, uh, here at Downey, in our mock-up, sees no reason for any concern, at least not yet. Uh, Bill, Leo? Uh A stabilization system and attitude control system to uh, get us in the attitude we want. Well, that way we can we uh, conserve the service module RCS pr uh, propellants. And uh, after a, this period of 13 or 14 minutes, then we will do the the separation maneuver and turn around, translate out with the command service module. Turn around, take a look at the S4B. We want to see if the slaw panels come off good this time. Make sure everything works when they cut off from it. Hmm? Yes. That's the idea. Walter, I'm intrigued, too, by another time element in all this. You said that the decision is due in about, uh, what, five or six minutes now, and yet if that decision is to go, it'll be another 25 minutes before they act upon it. Do you know the reason for that? Bill, for that, I've got the flight plan right in front of me. Let me see what they do during that period, and I'm sure that Leo knows as well. Uh, they, let's see, they get the go, no go for the TLI, the translunar uh, in, uh, insertion. Uh, then uh, the commander, that's Borman, is uh, aligning and, uh, and drifting, and a alignment and drift check. What's that, Leo? Well, he'll be aligning his FDAIs, these two flight direction attitude indicators, to make sure they both agree. Also, in this time period, uh, Jim Lovell has been down in the lower equipment bay getting out all the camera equipment and so forth. And uh, during this period of time, he gets back into the couch and gets strapped in and gets his couch reconfigured, which uh, is rather time consuming. So it isn't just a matter of uh, wanting to have a 25 minute delay. It's a, a matter of having a number of things to do and uh, they take that much time. Hmm? That's about the way it is, Leo? That's right. And, and then of course, they, they've got to get into the, just the proper attitude for that burn and monitor that attitude and be sure that they are in exactly the right position uh, before they kick off for that uh, five minutes and 41 seconds in which they accelerate. Uh, let's see, uh, Leo, they go from 60, uh, from 17,500 miles an hour to 20, almost 25,000 miles an hour in five minutes. That's a pretty snappy acceleration, isn't it? It's 6,700 miles per hour, I think, actually, in five minutes and 11 and a half seconds. Uh, so it's, uh, they, they got a pretty good boot out of this.
That's going to be just like a catapult shot off a carrier, Walter. <laughs> right. right. That uh, doesn't make it sound very comfortable, <laughs> but it is a jolt. <laughs> well, we'll be coming back. Stick around, gentlemen. Don't leave the spacecraft under, uh, under any circumstances. <laughs> We're not allowed to, Walter. <laughs>